Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Faith Community Bible Church Online. This Mother's Day, man, we are so grateful to be with y'all um, today. Listen, I just want to say happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. Listen, again, like we exist because of you. You not only give birth to us, but you nurture us, you cover us in prayer, millions of different things that you do to ensure that we live and are healthy in many different things. So mothers, happy Mother's Day to you. I also want to say happy Mother's Day to my own mother, um, Sherry Taylor, mama, I love you. My blind mama, um, love you so much and grateful to be your son. I also want to shout out Happy Mother's Day also to my mother, Tamara. So thankful um, to have both Sherry and Tamara in my life. I'm going to tell you, God thought so much of me to allow me to have a birth mother and a bonus mother, if will. So, so grateful um, to both of these women um, for loving me and raising me and being patient with me and everything. I also would like to, if I can, Say happy Mother's Day to my awesome wife, Tracy. I love you so much. Thankful um, that I have a privilege to, to parent with you and also how you love our children and, and also how you love me. Thank you for, for being a great mother and giving us the privilege to watch how you nurture our children. Um, love you guys and thank you so much. Y'all, I'm excited um, to be in worship today as we continue in our series through Colossians um, titled Centered. Um, and this is really an encouragement for all of us as we walk through um, the book of Colossians together in the midst of a pandemic. Just really a reminder for us to keep Jesus at the center of our life and that really our life should be centered in Jesus. So as we go forward in that today, grab your Bible, if will, and go with me to Colossians chapter two. Colossians chapter 2. I'll give you a minute to get there. Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. As you're going there, shout out to my baby boy, Tyler Bird, for, for opening us up today and leading us well. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler, for doing that today. Colossians chapter 2. Verses six and seven reads this way. So then, just as you've received Christ, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding with thanksgiving. Let me read that again. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him being rooted and built up in the faith and established in the faith, just as you were taught and abounding with thanksgiving or overflowing with gratitude. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, thank you for this moment that you continue to remind us, Lord, that you are in control of all things. And God, as we reflect, God, on the worship song, even that we just listened to, God, as creation reveals your glory, so will I. So I pray, God, that in our actions, that in our words, that you will be made much of. Lord, that everything that we say, everything we do will give you glory. Father, you are awesome. You are wonderful. You are holy. You are perfect, oh God. You are just and you hold this world in your hands. So God, we are thankful that we are able to be in relationship with you, God, to experience your goodness, to experience your glory. We thank you for your spirit, which leads and guides us. God reminds us of who you are. And I pray today that even as we worship virtually, that your spirit will rest in and through us. God, I pray that you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight my strength and my redeemer. I'm so unworthy, Lord, but what a privilege it is to be your child. What a privilege it is to be your vessel. Thank you, Father, for using broken sticks. And I pray today that we'll be faithful unto you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen. Just y'all for a couple minutes, 
I would like to preach from a subject, a response of maturity, a response of maturity. Here from Colossians chapter two, verses six and seven, I want to preach um, from a subject, a response of maturity, a response of maturity. Y'all, for many weeks, for us, things have been tough. We've been under a stay at home order for several weeks, not being able to gather face to face, not being able to hang out amongst one another. Um, everything that even everything that we do as a church, even with our friends, has now moved online, all due to this coronavirus, this COVID-19 pandemic. Now, many people um, are really affected by this and this heartbreaking really to see the numbers continually rise and close family members are dying and people are being affected by this and honestly it hurts but even this week even as we process and maneuver through this COVID-19 pandemic this week y'all we've been reminded of another pandemic that is constantly overlooked many overlook this pandemic that we've heard this week because in many ways they're just not affected by it. It doesn't affect them. It doesn't affect where they are. It doesn't knock on their front door, if you will. But, 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 but that, that there's been this, this pandemic that's been overlooked. Many overlook this again because it doesn't affect them while many actually cause this pandemic and call it freedom. We have been under a race pandemic for over hundreds of years. And as we think through and process how many African Americans have become victims of hate crimes, it's difficult to think through. It's difficult to process how even when you're jogging or even when you're walking down the street with Skittles, you can't even wear a hood without really this pandemic affecting you sometimes. We are in a country that herald statements like this is the land of the free and the home of the brave when it really isn't true for all people. We're in a country that loves to quote statements like with liberty and justice for all when really it's one-sided at best. Am I communicating that all people take this stance? That, that, no, no, that's not what I'm communicating at all. So, so, so I'm not trying to say that, that all people um, um, perpetuate this pandemic, but what I am saying is that we live in a system where this race pandemic is being perpetuated. When people who are up at higher levels, right, can make decisions and not stand for justice and freedom when it doesn't affect people who look like them. We have to respond to this immaturity. The question really that believers who are affected by this pandemic must ask themselves, how do I respond to issues like this? What words can I say? What do I do with all these emotions that, that, that I have regarding these issues? I, Pastor, I mean, I know it's not everybody, but for those who talk crazy on Facebook feeds, for those who talk crazy on blogs, and those who post these pictures, how, what do I do? How do I respond to this? What do I say when I read or hear or experience racism or racist comments and words that make me feel less than human? How should I react when I'm constantly judged based off the color of my skin and not the content of my character? What should I do when I fit a description, not because of something that I've done, but rather because of what I look like? How do I respond to this when I can't even jog? down the street, when I can't listen to music in my car, when I can't wear a hoodie or even speak my piece without being blackballed, what do I do? How do I respond? How do I have pastor these conversations with my son? Tell him that all of us were created equal when we live in a world, right, that where some people perpetuate this idea that's, that's not true. How, how do I have a conversation with my son and tell him this? Well, honestly, I'm glad you're, you're asking that question. I'm glad you're thinking through this. What I really want you to know, um, those of us who believe in Jesus, who have accepted Christ as our Savior, we should have a mature response to the things that this world presents. 
And, and that's really, that, that's the main point, right? We should have a mature response to the things that this world presents. See, responding with maturity, listen, believer, responding with maturity says that I refuse to allow even my frustration to push me to use words that won't glorify Jesus. Responding in maturity says that no matter what things look like around me, I will still ensure, make decisions, create rhythms where God is being glorified. Come here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you eat or drink, do so to give God glory. Come here, Colossians chapter 3. Work heartily to the Lord. You believer, your allegiance is to the Lord, not this enemy of the world. So you have to respond in maturity. And if you're having a difficult time responding in maturity, then you should probably unplug, spend some time with Jesus and let his spirit saturate not only your mind, not only your heart, but also your mouth. We have to respond in maturity. Hey, listen, listen, God alone is our resource. God alone is our resource and all growth comes by grace through him. But we are responsible to make the choice to obey. It's our responsibility and being obedient to the Lord calls us to be mature in our responses. See, Peter, Peter helps us in this area, y'all, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 and 8, verse 5 through 8, he says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, being effective and fruitful in the knowledge of Christ, y'all, is the essence of spiritual maturity. And what we must do is ensure that as believers, as we are in the hands of a Savior, we must respond with maturity. We must Y'all um, have a mature response to the things that this world presents. Let me tell you this. Unbelievers are going to be unbelievers. And understanding that unbelievers are going to be unbelievers, they're going to respond in a worldly way. But those of us who belong to Jesus, we must respond in a way that gives glory to God. Our lives must always be arrows that point to Jesus. Therefore, we must respond in a spiritually mature way to this thing that these world presents. Right here in this text, Paul here shows us what a mature response looked like. Now remember, right, the Colossian church was being given bad information. The Colossian church was under attack from false teachers who were really um, denigrating the deity, the nature, the very character of Christ. They were teaching that he was not actually God. And though Paul had never been to the church itself. He addressed the issues of this church head on. The nature of Christ as creator and redeemer was non-negotiable. So Paul wrote to them that he might uh, bring his wisdom to bear on this difficult and trying situation. And I believe that if we really process and think through, right, Paul's letter to the church of Colossae, we will begin to wrap our minds around that the same instruction, the same encouragement, the same wisdom that Paul was given to those in Colossians is the same encouragement, the same instruction that he's given to us. It, 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 it was critical to Paul that this church know Jesus and his greatness and his glory rather than in the deficient view given to them by those who were saying craziness. Now, it was interesting. That in the land of the free, in the home of the brave, right, people will say with their mouth they believe in Jesus and take all these serious theological stances, but show favoritism and partiality to people who don't look like them. People need to repent. But our response is not to take vengeance into our own hands, but know and understand that we must, as his church, know Jesus in his greatness, know Jesus 
in his glory and not allow our view of Jesus and our view of being the bride of Christ to be watered down by people who have these false ideas, these false realities of what they think people should do. We don't move and shake based off of what people think we should do, but God gives us direction, right? Come here, uh, Proverbs chapter three, trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your mind. Lean not into your own understanding in all your ways. He says, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Who is him? Him is God. God is directing our paths, not the ideas and ideologies of people. Therefore, our response should give glory to Jesus. It should be a mature response. He wanted them to mature. So that they'll know not only how to recognize foolishness, but also how to respond to foolishness. Let me remind you, family, that spiritual maturity is achieved through becoming more like Christ, not by saturating ourselves with dumb dialogue. Spiritual maturity is achieved through pursuing and bearing the image of Christ. Not by saturating ourselves with media comments, quotes, and videos from websites that don't encourage our heart, but further breaks our heart. See, after salvation, listen, every Christian, um, after salvation, every Christian begins the process of spiritual growth with the intent to become spiritually mature. And according to the Apostle Paul, it's an ongoing process that will never end in its life, right? In, in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 and 14, speaking of full knowledge of Christ, um, Paul tells his readers that he himself has not already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul says, brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heaven within Christ Jesus. Let me tell you, you don't mature by focusing on former things, but you mature by focusing on what's ahead. And if you know what's ahead of you, right, if you know that a solid relationship with Jesus is what's ahead of you, then I want to focus on that. It don't mean that those things happened yesterday don't frustrate, don't frustrate me. It doesn't mean that those things that I experienced don't cause me to boil. But what it does say is that I will not allow the things in my past to cause me to question the power of God. I won't allow the things in my past, right, to cause me to respond in a way that's going to injure the cross more. I got to respond to maturity. He tells them, no. I love Paul. He tells them, he tells them, um, De Deacon Willis, he tells them how to mature, right? He, to, to ensure that, that they matured, Paul told them to be knit together in love, right? We talked about that last week, be knit together in love, to be unified. He said, understand the knowledge of God's mystery. He said, know the truth, right? And, and he told them to be firm in their faith, stand, right? That is how we mature. We must mature, y'all, not only so that we can recognize foolishness, but also that we can respond to foolishness well. See, let me tell you, if all you're doing is feeding your flesh, it's going to be difficult for you to respond in maturity because what you're doing is you're feeding your old self, which is going to be ready to respond in a way that doesn't give glory to Jesus, but just to show how tough you really are. God didn't create us to be tough. He, he, he called us to be obedient because really all the strength that we have is Jesus anyway. I ain't saying that we ought to be a bunch of spiritual pumps, but what I am saying that we are called to be people that point directly to Jesus and surrender our will to him. As believers, y'all, we must have a mature response to the things that this world presents. Our response to foolishness should be one that keeps Jesus at the center. See, listen, many of us at times begin to wonder why if people tell us crazy things or do foolish things to us, why we always have to be nice to them? Why do we always have to be the mature ones? 
Why do I always have to do things this way? Why do I always have to give my battles to the Lord? Well, Paul says it. But Paul answers that for us in verse six. He says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord. Now, notice this. He didn't recklessly correct you. He didn't unlovingly correct you. He didn't come at you right on your Facebook wall. He didn't make subliminal comments, right? He didn't send nasty text messages, right? He lovingly, right? What did he do? He said, therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, what did Christ do? How did Christ respond to our foolishness, right? He lovingly brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Our response should be mature because we belong to Jesus. And those people who respond in foolish ways, then what should kick in for the blood bought is to be intentional in our evangelistic approach, not to get to not to take it personal, but to point them to Jesus. I can argue with you until I'm blue in the face, but until the Lord rocks your heart and help you to see it, there's nothing else we can do. Jesus um, um, brought us out of the mire, out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay and placed our feet on a rock. He lovingly brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Therefore, our response should be mature, believer, because we belong to Jesus. Paul says, therefore, as you receive Christ, we belong to Christ. Our, and our response should say we belong to Christ. It's because we belong to Christ is why we respond maturely. It's because we belong to Jesus. We represent him. We are his ambassadors. We are chosen people, a royal priesthood created for good works. We belong to Christ. We are in the hands of our creator. We belong to Christ. He gave his life for us on the old rugged cross that we may be returned back into right relationship with God. We belong to Christ. Therefore, we ought to respond maturely It's because we belong to Christ. That's why we can't pop off because we belong to Christ. That's why our approach should always be love because we belong to Christ. That's why we ought to be arrows that point to him. Why? Because we belong to him. Our response to this world or the things that this world presents should be a mature response. And having a mature response, this text shows us three actions or three things that that includes, right? Number one, a mature response involves our behavior. It involves our behavior. Believers should respond to foolishness in a way that keeps Jesus at the center, right? And from this text, Paul shows us how to respond in maturity. Um, first, we see that a mature response involves our behavior. Watch what he says in verse six. Therefore, he says, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Now, now, this is where it gets good, right? Because to, um, to walk in Christ, listen to this, is to live a life patterned after his. How? By being rooted and built up, strengthened in him. Listen, church, we cannot walk, behave in Christ on our own. See, this word here, walk, brings us back to our English word, behavior. Do you know that there is no way that you can experience God and not change? There is no way that you can experience the salvific work of Jesus on the cross and not change. What, what does that say? That says that even the words that come out of my mouth, that don't glorify him should convict me. That means that even as I think through this world, to think through the things that this world presents, my behavior to these things should still be one that glorifies the Father. Listen, church, we cannot behave in Christ on our own. His spirit is what empowers us to live in a way that brings him glory. See, when we are filled with his spirit, meaning that we belong to him, we must behave like it. Let me ask you this. What does your behavior say about you? Well, pastor, I'm going to tell you, nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect, pastor. Well, let me tell you this. You're wrong. There is somebody that's perfect. And his name is Jesus. That's how we know that his spirit has empowered us to live for him because we can't. Let me tell you this. 
If we continue to make excuses as to why we don't behave in a godly way, um, we'll never make changes. Because what happens is that we, we fall in love with these destructive patterns. And then when we hit a brick wall, we blame God or the enemy. No, you have to behave like you belong to Jesus. What Paul is saying here is conduct yourself and live your life in such a way that honors Jesus. See, they had accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Colossians, right? They had even believed in him and placed their trust in him. Therefore, they ought to live their lives in such a way that honors him as Lord. And you must live your life the same way. It was not enough, y'all, for Paul to see people make a profession of faith in Christ. As important as that was, Paul's ministry, y'all, was not to just see people accept Christ, but to present them mature in Christ. Woo! He, Paul wanted to see those in Colossae live out their faith in a way that honored Jesus as Lord. And that ought to be your desire. You ought to want to live your life in a way that honors Jesus. Let me ask you this. What is it that's keeping you from honoring Jesus? What is it that's keeping you, right? What, what is it about your behavior that's pushing you further and further away from Jesus? Let's ask it a different way. What is it that's, that's making you so comfortable not pursuing Jesus. Y'all, we cannot go around living any kind of way thinking that it's okay to do whatever we want to do. For the believer, y'all, there is a standard. For the believer, there's a way that we ought to live. For the believer, there's a way that we ought to behave. Mature behavior, y'all, has been shown to us all through Scripture. Come here, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice of God. Come on over to my house, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. He says, and by this, we know that we have come to know him. Watch this. If we keep his commandments. Woo, I know we don't like that. We skip that. Kayla, Kayla, we skip that. Right? We, we, we don't want to talk about following God's commandments because it's so much com it's so much more fun doing what I want to do. No, he says, uh -uh. by this we know that we come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, listen to this, he says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Listen. An intimate relationship with Christ makes it both possible and appealing for us to obey God just as Jesus did. What am I saying? You can either keep making excuses or you can make changes. If we think of salvation as an invitation to sin, he'll forgive me anyway. If, if that's your thinking, you're on the wrong track. You're on the wrong track. Believer, you must have a mature response to what life presents. And that is shown by how you behave. We must behave, walk in him. Paul talking to the believers in Colossae, which can also be applied to believers everywhere. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, talk like it. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, Lord, walk like it. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, your life ought to be an arrow that points directly to Jesus. As you were saved by faith, so walk by faith. As you were saved by the word, so walk according to the word. As you were saved through the work of the spirit, so walk in the spirit. The Christian life continues. As it began, how? By faith. Scripture says we are saved by grace through faith. And therefore, as you receive Christ, behave like it. A mature response involves not only our behavior, but number two, number two, a mature response involves our belief. It involves our belief. He says in verse seven, root it and built up in him and established in the faith. 
right? When he says here, rooted and built up in him and established by the faith, he's not making two different statements there. He's making one statement and he's repeating it, right? You got to be rooted and built up. Um, you have to be established in the faith. See, maturity, y'all, causes us to respond to what we believe in. Woo-hoo-hoo. Woo! Yeah, I know we on video. I got to take my, my flip-flops off because that, that, that just excites me right there to think through that. Listen, maturity causes us to respond in what we believe in. If you want to see what somebody believes, let them talk long enough, you'll see. Right? You, you, you want to see what somebody believe in, watch their behavior, right? We just said it, right? If you love me, you will keep my commands. See, we, we meet people, or some of us may even be that person, who say Jesus with their mouth, but when it comes to embracing it with your heart, you tend to veer off the road. What's missing? It's not believing in the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, but delighting in that fact, embracing that fact, and making Christ the treasure and the Lord of your life by surrendering to him. Why do we have a hard time embracing what we believe? Because we don't want to surrender to the Lord fully. We don't want to surrender to the Lord fully because we like to be in control. But do you know that everything you touch, you contaminate? What you believe is a reflection, right, of how you behave. There's no way, again, there's no way you can experience Jesus and not change. In other words, belief is seeing Jesus for who he really is, seeing him as infinitely valuable as the Son of God. It's not just acknowledging the fact that he's the Son, but also seeing him as infinitely, watch this, infinitely precious and valuable. How do you view Jesus? Because if you view Jesus the way the Scripture views Jesus, you, you, you will be hungry to get to know him. You will be hungry to live for him. You will be hungry for your response to be one that gives him glory. See, the sense here, y'all, is really objective, right? Referring to the truth of Christ or, or the truth of Christian doctrine. See, spiritual maturity, y'all, develops upward from the foundation of biblical truth as it's taught. The rooting and the building and establishing is in sound teaching. Where, where's the breakdown? Past this, a breakdown in communication somewhere. Actually, it's not a breakdown in communication. Um, it's a breakdown in your action. It's a breakdown in your thoughts. Right? Because your natural inclination, the natural inclination of this world is to respond based off of how they feel. But 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 what but what the Lord wants us to know, what the Lord is calling us to, hey, I, I, he's not asking us to divorce ourselves from our feelings, but he's encouraging us to be led by his spirit, to be rooted and built up in the truth that he's presented to us. Let me tell you, church, our faith must be firm in Christ. We should not trust in this foolishness that this world is presenting. Well, Pastor, I know that me having a mature response right involves my behavior. But, 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 but Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, saying that a mature response involves my belief. But I believe that this world is sinful. It is. I believe that this world is overlooking us. And, and some people are. Well, what should my response to it be? Your response to the things of this world is to always speak truth to power. Man, I wish I could get about five or six likes right there, right? Your response should always be, always be to respond maturely, respond in a way that gives God glory. Well, well, um, 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 how do I speak truth to power? By standing up for the least of these. By standing up for the least of these. There is no way, listen to this, there is no way that we can hear somebody saying something crazy, right, and not approach them in love. Woo! We have to be willing and be, 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 be willing to have difficult conversations in a loving way, right? And let me tell you this, that difficult conversation in a loving way is not your Facebook feed. That difficult conversation in a loving way, right, is not the comment section on blogs, right? Because I'm going to tell you something, right? The, the, the conversations in love that we have are people within our sphere of influence who we can actually talk to calmly. It's interesting. 
that we would much rather have a conversation with people who we would much rather have conversations from a distance rather than picking up the phone and call folks because really we all want to hide behind screens. No, no, no. Your mature response, yes, it involves your behavior, but it also involves what you believe. Because if you believe in Jesus, your life will imitate Jesus. And if your life is a reflection of Jesus, then you're not going to mind having hard conversations. Our faith, y'all, must be found on nothing less than Jesus. Jesus must be the all-sufficient reason and purpose for everything that the church not only does, but is doing. Your response involves your belief. That's why we are told, y'all, to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, teaching us and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When we truly believe in God, our hearts cannot be swayed. Maturity, y'all, will be evident with how we respond. And our response involves not only our behavior, but also our belief. Remember, church, remember this. Remember this. We should respond to foolishness in a way that shows Jesus is the center of our life. Paul, here in our text, was struggling because he wants them to mature, not only in their knowledge of Christ, but also how they respond to the things of this world. A mature response to what this world presents involves our behavior. Therefore, as we receive Christ, we must walk behave in him. It involves our belief being established in our faith, rooted and built up in him. But finally, um, as I close, listen, not only does it involve our behavior, not only does it involve our belief, but number three, it involves our blessing. It involves our blessing. Listen, he says, therefore, as you receive Christ, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding, he says, abounding in thanksgiving or overflowing with gratitude. See, the Bible is filled with commands for us to give thanks to God. We see that in Psalms 106, verse 1, and 1 Chronicles 16, 34, which both heralds the same thing. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks in all circumstances. First Thessalonians 5 18 says, for this is the will of God in Christ. Some even tell us why, right? Psalms 136 verse 3, give thanks to the Lord of Lords for his steadfast love endures forever. He says abounding in, being excessive in, thanksgiving. Well, what's the blessing, pastor? What am I thankful for? Why should I be abounding in thanksgiving? Why should I be, be um, overflowing, overwhelmed with gratitude, right? Why should I? Right? Why should I be thankful even though things are happening in this world that's calling me, causing me pain? Why should I be thankful in a world that makes me feel like I'm nothing. Why should I be thankful when it seems like I'm always under attack? What should fuel my thankfulness, right? I'm glad that you asked, right? While we were yet sinners, here's the shouting material. Here's the blessing. Here's what should fuel us to be uh, um, abounded or abound in thanksgiving because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What should fuel our thankfulness is that God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We ought to abound in thanksgiving. Why? Because we recognize that we are no different from the ones that's causing us pain. We're no different. We're no different. We're no different. Right? Therefore, we ought to abound in thanksgiving because God, instead of throwing broken sticks away, he calls us into relationship with him. Whew. He knew no sin. 
died for sinful men, and regardless of what others say around us or how they try to sway us, we should be thankful that we know who Jesus is. Let me tell you this. Listen, when you know who Jesus is, you ought to be thankful. Who is Jesus? Listen, let me tell you. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1 says, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's why we ought to abound in thanksgiving, right? We receive, right? right. Why are we abounding in thanksgiving? Why are we um, overwhelmed with gratitude, overwhelmed with thankfulness because of the blessing that we receive, right? What is that blessing? What is this blessing? A relationship with the king of kings, a relationship with the Lord of lords, a relationship with the healer, a relationship with a deliverer, a relationship with the provider. Jesus is, y'all know the song, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light over darkness. We ought to abound in thanksgiving because of who Jesus is. That's why we ought to be thankful. How are you responding? What does your behavior say about you? Does your belief point to Jesus? Let me ask you this way. What do you value more? Your ethnicity or your relationship with Jesus? I'm not saying. But don't hear me saying um, that, that um, our ethnicity isn't it, it important? But I want you to hear me say that nothing should be more important in your relationship with Jesus. What does your behavior say about you? What does your belief say about you? Or you resting in the blessing of relationship with Jesus? Believer, our response to the things that this world presents should always be one of maturity. We must Give a mature response to the craziness that plagues this culture. We must give a mature response to those who question or attempt to sway us from who or what the scriptures teaches us about Jesus. Know that as believers, our response must be one that keeps Jesus as our focal point. Therefore, we must behave in him. We must believe in him. And we must rest in the blessing of having a sincere relationship with him. All that we say and do should point to Jesus. That's why, y'all, those who tend to question him for who he is and what he does, we prove wrong. Not by our opinions, but by the truth. What am I saying? Believer, you got to grow in maturity. And you must allow your life to point to Jesus. I know that all of us are frustrated. All of us are in a position that's causing pain. Either the COVID-19 pandemic or a racial pandemic that we've been experiencing for hundreds of years. Maybe you're in a thought process of where you think that everybody's wrong. Everybody feels this way. Let me tell you, everybody doesn't feel that way. Some do, but it's not everybody. But regardless to that, those of us who believe in Jesus, our response should be a response of maturity, knowing that how we behave is a way to is a way that we respond to. it. What we believe is a way that we respond to. it, And how we rest in these blessings, the blessing of having a solid relationship with Jesus is how we respond. to. It. I want you to. As we pray, process your own heart. 
Well, Pastor, you talked about the believers. You talked about how believers should respond, but how should an unbeliever respond? Well, an unbeliever is going to be an unbeliever. And they're and they going to respond in a way that makes them be on the top of the totem pole. But if you are an unbeliever and you're watching this, you too can respond like a believer by first becoming a believer. Well, what does it look like? Well, believe in who? Believing in Jesus. I'm not saying we have all the answers. But what I am saying is that Jesus has the power to save us. What I am saying to you today is that God is holy. God is righteous and he won't ignore sin. What I am saying to you is that man, me included, all of us, be it online or maybe you will watch this later. Man, all of us sinned against God. Therefore, our relationship with God is broken and anything that's broken needs to be fixed. This world will not be fixed by us. Only Jesus can fix brokenness. Well, how did he fix it? Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, gave his life on the cross. He was innocent. We were guilty. Jesus took our sin on his back, died in a borrowed tomb, rose from the grave three days later with all power in his hands, died on the cross for us. He took our sins to the cross. Everything that we've ever done wrong, he took to the cross. He fixed what we broke. What should our response be? To turn from sin and turn to him. So unbeliever, you today can respond. You can respond to Jesus, which will allow you to respond to this world in maturity. What am I saying? Right? What, what do I want you to know? I want you to know that because you respond to Jesus in faith, the world still won't change. But the way you view the things that this world does will, knowing that while it may hurt, God will still be glorified through it. We must respond in a way that gives glory to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, this moment, this opportunity that you've given us. And I pray today, God, that you will help us to know you, help us to trust you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to lean and to depend on you. God, one thing we know and we stand on, Father, is that it's not always easy to process what happens around us. But I pray that those of us who belong to you, Lord, that you will allow us, Lord, to reflect on how we respond to the things of this world. But let us, oh Lord, rest in knowing that our response should be one that gives you glory. God, I pray that you will allow us to see things your way. Not to take matters into our own hands, but to take our hands off. But I want to pray today, Lord, for those who don't know you, that even their response, Lord, that their response to what happens, Lord, will be to respond to you as Savior and King, that they would trust in you and you alone. Father, we love you. We honor you. We adore you, Jesus. We make you big, Father, because you and you alone deserve all the glory, honor, and the praise. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer. Heal our hearts and keep our minds fixed on you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for hearing our prayer. Everybody say amen. Amen. Thank you all for logging in today to our worship experience online here at Faith Community Bible Church where we exist to make Christ known in the community by caring for the community. And if there's any way we can pray for you, text us at 314-635-8539. If you would like more information about Faith Community Bible Church, you can also text call me or more information. Text us and let us know what you need at 314 314- 635-8539. Feel free as well to check us out on the web, fcbcstl.com. Learn more about our church, about our leaders, or if you would like to have a conversation with a pastor, you can also text call me to 314-635-8539. Again, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. We are so thankful for you and grateful that you um, are in our lives and we have the privilege to experience you 
We love you. Have a great day. God bless you guys. And thanks for tuning in.